Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andre Nell, Professor of Medicine at uh, UCLA, and I'm glad to introduce the session 12, Nanomedicine and Precision Medicine Context uh, in the Future. Um, please just note that our second speaker, uh, Daryl Irvine, um, uh, could not uh, come for uh, personal reasons, and uh, so I've uh, asked to uh, put in uh, a short talk uh, myself uh, for that time period. Um, I'm happy to introduce to you as our first speaker, Dr. Anil Patri, who is the chair of the Nanotoxicology Task Force and the director of the Nanotechnology uh, Core Facility in the U.S. FDA, National Center for Toxicological Research in Jefferson, Arizona. The title of his talk is Global Collaborations in Regulatory Science and Standards Development. Anil? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank uh, Beat Lofler for providing excellent venue every year um, for scientific discourse in nanotechnology, nanomedicine. Um, I'm excited for two reasons today. Uh, first reason is I'm waiting for Don Tamalia's talk later in the session about dendromers uh, getting into phase three clinical trials. And then the second reason I'm excited about is that I just heard um, another talk from industry where they are taking dendromers into preclinical to clinical trials. And so uh, having grown in the dendromer field and then being a student of Don Tamalia, um, I'm really excited that, that these things, these products are being developed using dendromers beyond the liposomes, polymers, and emulsions that we are all used to. So I'm from FDA, and I'm going to uh, present, uh, uh, actually Biat asked me to present on the global collaborations in regulatory science and standards development. I presented about standards development uh, of the global summit um, last year, so I'm going to present about the, the various ways that we collaborate from FDA uh, with other regulatory agencies and, and other agencies. Uh, so beyond the basic preclinical studies of an innovative idea, those that are serious in clinical translation are often concerned about the um, regulatory hurdles and challenges. And so they have to come to FDA and other regulatory agencies uh, across the globe. We certainly realize at FDA um, that the potential of these novel nanotechnology products ex exists, whether it is there for cancer, um, for infectious diseases, um, or many other applications that we see at FDA. And by the way, there is a gradual increase in submissions to FDA um, over the last 40 years, but more so in the last 10 years. So FDA has a, um, the primary function is to protect public health, but also promote public health by advancing any novel technologies that have safe, safety and effectiveness profile. So in this context, um, I would like to bring about the F FDA's uh, globalization. Uh, so there, there are a lot of um, products that come to FDA, and these are produced in many countries, over 150 countries, uh, more than 130,000 importers and 300,000 facilities outside of the U.S. Um, when it comes to drugs and devices, nearly 40 percent of the finished drugs and 50 percent of the medical devices used by Americans are made elsewhere. So approximately 80 percent of the manufacturers of APIs uh, used in the U.S. are located abroad. So you can imagine the global context of what we have to uh, understand and, and uh, work with. Uh, there are increase in FDA registered drug facilities. There are global trends of gradual increase. Um, for example, uh, we have seen increase in these drug facilities in India and China uh, in the last five years. Between 2011 and 2015, there is 55 percent increase in India and then more than 60 percent increase in China. So eventually these uh, products will come through uh, FDA because they are FDA approved facilities. 
uh, and and so we we would like to collaborate with uh, international regulators on on any of these products coming through. Um, so this is a trend you may have seen this slide, uh, um, a survey done by my colleague Catherine Tyner, who may have presented in the previous session in the last 40 years uh, of nanotechnology submissions to FDA. And you see a, there is a gradual increase in the submissions of INDs, um, investigational new drugs, new drug applications that is in the red bar, and then ANDAs, which is, uh, these are generics. Um, so you see a gradual increase, and same trend we have observed with devices. So gradual increase in devices containing nanomaterial, and then you see some examples of the kind of devices that contain nanomaterial. So not only do we see the increase in the submissions, but also we see the complexity of these products is increasing. And so um, certainly uh, standards are very important for us as uh, we work with uh, regulators and then industry uh, to, to help uh, in the translational uh, process. So briefly about the uh, regulatory science and, and uh, their, uh, the definition of regulatory science is that science of developing new tools, standards, and approaches to assess the safety, efficacy, quality, and performance of uh, regulated products. Uh, and and uh, uh, I'm going to present about the regulatory science and the standards development and the global collaboration in that, in that context. So uh, one area that FDA uh, works with other international regulators is through the Global Coalition for the Regulatory Science Research, or GCRSR. Uh, again, last year I presented about the, the nanotechnology meeting we had in 2016. That's a global summit for regulatory science, uh, focusing on nanotechnology applications and, and standards. And then there is a report that was released uh, which contains all the standards that are needed for regulating medical products, including drugs, devices, food, food contact material, generic drugs, uh, liposomes, and so on. So uh, this is an international coalition of uh, global reg uh, regulatory bodies, um, and uh, it, it facilitates and promotes the development of regulatory science research as a tool for advancing, uh, uh, I'm sorry, regulatory science applicable to the public health. Established in 2003, uh, every three years we have nanotechnology, so in, uh, meetings, so 2016 was focused on nanotechnology in 2019 will be nanotechnology. Um, so we have members from uh, across the globe, and these are the members that you can see. Uh, apart from FDA, uh, we have from Japan, from Brazil, from European Union, JRC, uh, European Medicines Agency, European Food Safety Authority, uh, Therapeutic Goods Administration, Australia, uh, uh, Canadian, uh, food inspection, oh, this is Chinese FDA, I think they have changed the name recently, uh, and then CFIA and Health Canada and Singapore and, and Martin Argentina. And so we come together every, every year and on a specified topic of interest, and, and nano comes every three years, as I mentioned. We have four working groups. One is a nanotechnology working group, bioinformatics, emerging technology, and the new uh, working group that is formed is a cross-training working group. Oops. So this is the um, report that was released uh, in 2016 from the meeting uh, of the Global Summit where we came together as regulators and standards developing bodies, both uh, from NIST, uh, from JRC, and, and the other global um, standards development organizations, including ISO and ASTM, um, to look at what standards do we need in drugs and devices. The reason for this is that uh, the, the, the ISO and ASTM, they have been developing standards for some time, more than 13 years or so. ISO TC229 started around 2005, and uh, most of the standards that were developed are based on carbonaceous material graphene, carbon nanotubes, and, and, and we have seen very little of those coming through FDA. And so uh, we decided to, 
to have a meeting around what kind of standards do we need? Because these are really novel products. Uh, they're, these are very complex in some ways and very simple in some other ways. But certainly we need uh, appropriate standards to help industry uh, get into this um, regulatory uh, approval process. Um, and so, we, that, again, that report is available. This is uh, uh, at the ASTM website, and then it's also available at other locations, so you can download this. And, and there are many uh, needs that came through by bringing all these regulators from across the globe to come together, uh, as well as industry and academics. And, and then so the plan is to develop these standards that are appropriate for medical products, drugs and devices, and then we have been actively involved in doing that. Um, the other collaboration that I would like to highlight here is the uh, International Pharmace Pharmaceutical Regulators Forum, and, and this is now IPRP, uh, and we meet every year at CLINAM. And so we, again, we come together um, as regulatory agencies, and most of these, uh, or all of these are members of IPRF. And uh, so we share non-confidential information and uh, regulatory harmonization or converge focused on nanomedicines and nanomaterial. Uh, we also uh, do regulatory cooperation and we also uh, conduct cross-training activities. Um, and then recently we had a, a, a training that FDA has, internal training, we offered that to Health Canada. And then so we are expanding this uh, training to um, other regulatory bodies. At the same time, we learn from their experience as to what kind of products that they regulate, and then uh, as required, we get training from the other regulatory bodies. And, and then also, finally, the consensus standard. This is, this is something that we come together on uh, across uh, all these regulatory agencies. The third one that I would like to highlight is the USEU Communities of Research. Uh, this is a collaboration between the National Nanotechnology Initiative in US and then European Commission. Um, again, this is coming together of all the government agencies as well as academics for most part uh, to, to engage in an active discussion uh, about EHS safety questions and nano-enabled products. Um, so we have joint programs to so le leverage resources. There is no funding set aside, but then we usually leverage between US and EU um, to conduct these studies, collaborative work, and, and uh, support these communities of research. So there are seven uh, groups within these, the databases and computational modeling, characterization, human toxicity, risk management, exposure through product life, risk assessment, ecotoxicology, these are the seven. And the new one is a nanomedicine working group. And, and this is something we are starting here at CLINAM on Wednesday. So again, this is an advertisement. Please come to the meeting. And uh, uh, this is Patrick Boisu from ETPN uh, and, and, and myself. We are co-chairing this nanomedicine working group. And this is a Wednesday afternoon session at CLINAM. Um, we are very active in the standards development organizations, ISO TC229, uh, as well as ASTM E56. So those of you who uh, know the, the ISO TC229, they have 65 published standards and 43 standards under development. Um, maybe half of those published standards are related to carbonaceous material. If you go through one by one, this is something we did a review on. Um, and then so now we are, FDA is more active uh, through these ISO and ASTM to bring appropriate standards that, that we need for regulatory purposes. And so there are uh, five working groups, terminology and nomenclature, measurement and characterization, health safety, environment and material specifications, and a new working group, which is products and applications. This is uh, again headed by my colleague at FDA, Jose Centino. Um, this is a website. You can go to the website. Uh, and, and the standards development process, as you, if you are involved in this process, it is a, it's a tedious process. It takes many years to develop one standard. And so you can imagine we need a lot more standards. And, and so by coming together, collaborating together, we can increase the number of standards that are relevant for medical purposes. 
The ASTM International E56 Subcommittee on Nanotechnology has 18 published standards, and there are seven new work items, and many of these are coming out of FDA uh, through stakeholder involvement, both uh, academic involvement as well as industry involvement. And, and some of them are on characterization, and then a uh, few of them are on biocompatibility studies. Again, there are several subcommittees, eight of them, and I don't need to read these, but the, the eighth one is a nano-enabled medical products. This is a new subcommittee, and so we are trying to develop standards through the subcommittee on medical products related nanotechnology. So FDA has a formal recognition program through the Center for Devices Radiological Health, CDRH, and, and uh, we recognized eight standards currently, and then I think five of them are from ASTM, or six of them are from ASTM, and then two of them are from ISO, and then you can read these. The advantage of this process is that once FDA recognizes a standard, industry can ut utilize that standard so that we understand that they use the, the procedures, the standard, and, and that way the, the submission process becomes stream streamlined with uh, less repetition going back and forth on the data that is submitted to FDA. So uh, certainly eight standards in nano is too little. Uh, we, we need a lot more standards, but also we need reference material. And this is where I keep pushing NIST to develop reference material as well as JRC, IRMM um, to, to, to produce reference material. So there are size measurement standards, but as you know, beyond size, there are surface characteristics that, that change completely the biodistribution of these nanomaterial. Slight changes in these properties significantly change the safety and efficacy of these formulations. So we certainly need those reference material standards to validate the assays uh, from these uh, um, documentary standards. So FDA is, again, very active in these. Uh, we have currently 1,200 recognized standards from CDRH, and then eight of them uh, are for nanotechnology, and then there is a database, a publicly available database that you can access. So one last slide uh, in the last minute that I have is uh, that FDA conducts a lot of regulatory science research. We invested in resources, we invested in lab, we invested in equipment, but also we do a lot of research projects within FDA, whether uh, depending on the platform and, and uh, whether they are devices or drugs or, or food or cosmetics, we have research projects within FDA. So we do a lot of regulatory science. Uh, I would like to highlight the liposome area because one-third of the submissions to FDA in drug products are liposome-based. And, uh, and, and this is an example of how we perceive nanotechnology to be. So we don't have any new regulations for drug products containing nanomaterial, but we use existing guidelines. But certainly the definition uh, depends on the composition and how you define the composition, the drug release profiles, and, and so on. So we, we conducted a lot of these studies. We do continuously conduct and look at the products. Uh, and then there is one cryo-TEM standard for liposomal characterization that just went through the ASTM process. So I think I ran out of my time. And then in summary, I would say that there is a global increase in the FDA-regulated products and, re and registered facilities. And there is a gradual increase in the drug products containing nanomaterial, not only just the number, but also the complexity. Uh, international collaborations in regulatory science and cross-training are key for harmonization and then finally development relevant standards enable clinical development of nanomaterial. That, again, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Anil. So we're open for, I have, we have time for one question. Then I asked one, as you mentioned, the, the, the liposome guidances, so there's also a liposome, a generic liposome guidance out. Now, there are other products which are kind of similar, but which are not exactly liposomes, like lipid nanoparticles uh, and polymer particles. Uh, you know, do you think that there will be guidances for all these other products upcoming, or what is, what is your uh, opinion on evaluating these kind of uh, related products, but not, which are not exactly liposomes. 
Yeah, so that's a good question. So we just got a, um, a draft guidance out, <clears throat> which is going to be, I think, presented by Katherine Tyner. Is she here? Yeah, so there she is. Uh, I think she presented in the previous session today about the, the guidance for, for drug products and biologics containing nanomaterial. So this is generic for all drug products and, and biologics containing nanomaterial. So we have a specific liposome guidance document for doxorubicin containing liposomes, but also there is a, an, uh, that's a draft guidance document, and then there is a, a, a final guidance for liposome products. But as needed, we will develop those additional guidances if we think they are needed. But for most part, this overarching guidance uh, would for now suffice uh, from our standpoint. But we do develop new guidances as, as they arise and need arise. Thank you very much, Anil. Thank you.